Thanks very much. It's really a pleasure to be here today. Um, I greatly appreciate the invitation to speak with you. And um, this is, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Harrison, this is a work in progress. Um, but I think that the story of the Sultana, as I'll, uh, as I'll outline in, um, in, in brief today, is really a fascinating and important story that deserves much more attention. I think this is an ideal venue to, uh, uh, to offer my reflections on the research that I've done to date. In late, in late April of 1840, a vessel arrived in New York City that was flying a red flag never before seen on American shores. This vessel was the Sultana, the flagship of Sultan Said Said bin Sultan of Oman and Zanzibar. Now, the Sultana had sailed from Zanzibar, which was at the time the emergent entrepot of East Africa, stopping only briefly on the way at the small island of St. Helena in the South Atlantic, before docking in Lower Manhattan which was really the heart of America's metropolis. The Sultana was under the command of an Arab emissary uh, with African and Persian officers and an English captain. The crew was both South Asian and East African. In its hold, the ship carried iconic Indian Ocean products, Awani dates, Zanzibari clothes, some of the first uh, Zanzibari clothes exported to the U.S., East African ivory, Yemeni coffee, and Persian carpets, among other things. So in many ways, the Sultana was a microcosm of the Western Indian Ocean world at the time, of Zanzibar specifically, and why. But just as important, the Sultana evidenced the Sultan's uh, and the Sultanate's direct engagement with world regions, both within and, in the case of New York, beyond the Indian Ocean region. And it also evidenced the Sultanate's interest in strengthening ties with the United States, specifically with the U.S. as an emerging economic power in the 19th century. In short, the Sultana was in many ways a testament to Oman Zanzibar's attempts to shape the emerging global relationships of the 19th century. Uh, this, by the way, is an image of the Sultana, uh, certainly the most detailed image I've been able to, to, to find uh, of another mission, uh, economic uh, and diplomatic mission to London, very soon after its mission to New York City. So this is a image from uh, 1842. The Sultana very quickly became a spectacle in New York City, which is one of the reasons why we have so much information about it. It made headlines, not just in New York, but actually right across the US. I've seen papers from all over America with stories about the Sultana in that spring and summer of 1840. In fact, crowds gathered almost daily around the ship. Uh, a ship that one reporter called, quote, the celebrated Arab ship. The vice president, the governor of New York State, and many other dignitaries paid visits to the ship. The primary focus uh, throughout, its, uh, throughout the spring and summer of 1840, uh, while the ship was in New York, uh, was the chief of the mission. Ahmed bin Ahmad al who uh, whose career in many ways was emblematic of the historical shifts that we see in the 19th century Western Indian Ocean region. So let me just say a word about him. I also want to say a word about the portrait itself. Um, but let me say a word about him, a biographical note uh, by way of introduction. Ahmad was born in the Persian Gulf. He studied in Bombay gained fluency in English as a result, and then served as the secretary to Sultan Said Said. He lived much of his life in Zanzibar, and he acted as the Sultan's envoy, not just to the United States, as we know, but also to England, 
also to Egypt and to China as well. So he had a quite long and illustrious career. In New York City, in 1840, however, he would captivate audiences in a way translating a lot in Zanzibar for American audiences and actually receiving many, many invitations, um, which is a point I'll return to uh, a bit later, giving many public uh, speeches and again, making, making headlines uh, across the US. In fact, so, so great was the interest in uh, Nahman and the visit of the Sultana that very soon after its arrival, in fact, the New York uh, City Common Council commissioned this portrait at actually great expense to be painted of Nahman. I'll come back to talk about this portrait and the details of the portrait, because I think they actually, the details are, are actually uh, very important. But before going any further, I want to address a very important question. Um, this, this was the first uh, actually Ar either Arab or African vessel to visit the United States. I want to address a really critical question, and that's why. Why did the Sultan of Oman and Zanzibar send this ship, particularly after 1840? Why 1840 and why to New York? Why not to Washington, D.C., for instance? And to understand this, to answer this question, we need a little bit of background. From the late 18th century, the fortunes of the Sultanate of Oman and Zanzibar were rising significantly. For instance, increased commercial activity um, uh, had transformed Zanzibar, a small island off the East African coast, into a burgeoning uh, island city that after 1840, in fact, very soon after the Sultan returned to Zanzibar, would become the kind of de facto capital of the Sultanate because Said Said would spend much of his time there uh, until close to the end of his life. Um, so this transoceanic, uh, Sultanate would have a very important uh, uh, seat of political power in East Africa as well as in Muscat. Uh, this, by the way, is just a, 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 a detail, another, really the only other image that, that I found of the Sultana, um, which was, of course, pictured in the background of that image, uh, that painting of Nahman. Now, the concentration of economic activity at Zanzibar facilitated for its okay, to strengthen ties with the East African interior, with Oman, with South Asia, with Europe, and the Americas, while drawing diverse residents and diverse merchants to, um, to both Zanzibar and Muscat. In the 1830s, merchants from across Eastern Africa, Southern Arabia, South Asia, North America, Western Europe, and elsewhere traded, um, traded at Zanzibar. Actually, let me show you this, too, before I move on. Uh, this is, a, as far as I know, one of the earliest images, earliest photographs of Muscat from about 1859, 1860. Uh, and you can see many vessels very similar to the Sultana in, in, uh, in harbor here. I'll go back to another image of, of Muscat in a moment. Uh, but this is essentially what the Sultanate of Oman and Zanzibar looked like in the mid-19th century, you can see uh, Oman to the right uh, uh, with the capital at Muscat, and in red indicated on the left from this 19th century map is the, uh, the realm of the Sultanate, which was actually quite extensive uh, by 1840 when the Sultan visited the United States, um, all the way down uh, from the north of Somalia, all the way down to uh, the border with Mogadita, sorry, the, the border with Mozambique itself. Here's just uh, an image of Zanzibar at the time, roughly at the time in the 1840s, uh, and uh, a rare image of actually, uh, in this case, a British merchant in Zanzibar at uh, mid-century, so a little bit later than the, the, the time the Sultan sailed with Zanzibar merchants. By the time the Sultan sailed for New York City, Zanzibar had become the primary regional supplier of diverse goods, um, and really the most important regional marketplace uh, for East African exports. 
uh, including things like uh, ivory that would be exported to the United States. Uh, South Asian, Southern Arabian, and East African merchants dominated the Zanzibari market, but in the early decades of the 19th century, Americans found a unique economic niche in East Africa. Americans had a hard time trading in many of the other places of British dominance, French dominance in the Indian Ocean, but Zanzibar opened the door to uh, kind of uh, uh, American niche trade in the Western Indian Ocean region, in part because Americans were trading American uh, manufactured cotton cloth, which became very popular in both East Africa and Southern Arabia. This is an image of, of Zanzibar, which I would want. Uh, the island of Zanzibar, uh, Zanzibar town, uh, central left. And these are, again, some of the earliest images that we have. Uh, these are from the 1840s of the Sultan's residence at Mutoni on Zanzibar. So, America was exporting uh, cotton cloth to East Africa. And I'll, I'll get to this in a moment, but that's primarily what the Sultana returned from New York with. Massachusetts made cotton cloth. Uh, this was one of the engines of the regional, the whole of the East African, and to a degree even the Southern Arabian uh, economy in terms of import. Uh, in fact, so important was, uh, was the Western Indian Ocean to the American cotton uh, cloth industry, of course, the, 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 the bedrock of American industrialization, that this, not so long after the Sultana sailed to the United States, the first steam-powered uh, textile mill in the United States was built in part uh, by people who had invested in the East African, the Omani Zanzibar market. So anyway, this is an image from Salem, Massachusetts, which had particularly close connections with uh, the Western Indian Ocean. In fact, merchants from Salem, Massachusetts, would become so important in East Africa for the American trade that part of the reason for the mission to New York City was to bypass the kind of power that merchants from Salem held in the American trade with the Western Indian Ocean, a point to which I will return moment. In fact, by the end of the 1830s, American vessels from Salem made up actually the majority of Western ships in Zanzibar. Now also in the 1830s, U.S. Omani and Zanzibari trade was of growing importance to both states. And this precipitated uh, an official treaty of free trade in 1833 between Oman and States. Here's just another image of, uh, of Muscat from that same time period, uh, the end of the 1850s, a little bit later than when the Sultana sailed, but actually um, uh, some of the earliest images that we have. Now, when this commercial treaty went into effect uh, uh, in 1834, it granted the Sultanate of Oman and Zanzibar quote unquote most, sorry, most favored nation status which was quite significant in terms of trade. Thereafter, the Sultanate's relationship with American merchants would become actually quite complex. And the Sultan, uh, Sayyid Said, saw the potential of other trade initiatives as well, and actually wanted to take full advantage of the terms of this new treaty, which exempted the Sultanate from import duties in American ports. Hence the desire to send his own ships to America. Moreover, he wished to augment Zanzibar's unidirectional relationship with the United States by sending, again, his own vessels to the US, which would very clearly ensure great benefits. Uh, and in fact, if you read the correspondence of American merchants, they were quite concerned about the fact that the Sultan would send his own ships because it meant he could buy American goods much cheaper than Americans were selling. American goods in uh, the Western Indian Ocean. In fact, the early 19th century actually saw the robust development of the Sultan's uh, and the Sultanate's multi-directional trade initiatives. And this is kind of the larger point that I want to make today, is that yes, there was direct trade between the United States, um, between Western Europe uh, and Oman and Zanzibar, but some of that was actually on uh, uh, Oman and Zanzibar's own terms. 
was direct trade initiated by Oman and Zanzibar. So this was an extension of a wider vision, both to exert greater control over the Sultanate's global economic relationships and also to raise its international profile. And so an important thing to remember about the mission of the Sultanate, it was both to trade but also to essentially um, demonstrate to the New Yorkers as, again, the economic hub of the United States, the quality of goods in the Sultanate's realm, or that were traded through Moscow and Zanzibar. Now, all of this was contingent to a degree on the Sultanate's maritime capacity. So let me say a word about that. And again, this is why I want to show the image of uh, Muscat at Harvard for roughly this time. Because most of the fleet of the Sultanate was actually uh, Dao's. And when I say Dao's, I'm referring to a very diverse array of Western Indian Ocean vessels that had long been the backbone of Indian Ocean traders. In fact, Omani Dao's traveled not just to East Africa and to Madagascar, but actually as far as um, the Bay of Bengal in the Eastern Indian Ocean, to Java in contemporary Indonesia, so right across the whole of the Indian Ocean region. <clears throat> That's only one dimension, actually, of the uh, Sultanate's uh, maritime capacity, because it also had many Western-style ships like the Sultana, frigates, brigs, corvettes, great diversity of Western style. Vessels up to a thousand tons, which is substantially larger than the Sultan was. Uh, what happened is that the Sultan commissioned these vessels from places as far away as the United States, but more commonly from India, from Bombay, from Cochin, um, and many other places around the world. So in the 1830s, uh, with the Sultanate's consolidation of this long coast of East Africa. Uh, the consolidation of power along the Swahili coast in the 1830s, the Sultan began converting a lot of warships uh, to trade vessels and sending these primarily between Oman and Zanzibar, um, Zanzibar and Bombay, Oman and Calcutta, and so forth, across the Western Indian Ocean region. So the Sultana, if we look at it more specifically, going back to this image from 1842, Sultana was actually built in India. It was built in Bombay, but a Western style vessel. He would visit Mauritius in the southwestern Indian Ocean. It would visit Calcutta in the eastern uh, South Asia. And it actually, before it sailed to New York, traveled very regularly between Muscat and Zanzibar. New York, however, offered new opportunities for Zanzibar to trade. Um, and the leading merchants of Zanzibar, because it would allow them to circumvent the strength that American traders held in the exchange between the U.S. and um, Oman and Zanzibar. Essentially, as I mentioned a moment ago, sending the Sultana to the United States, or sending it to London, as we saw very soon thereafter, would allow the Sultanate to buy, the Sultan uh, and his, his traders, his merchants, to buy goods at a much cheaper price at their source, essentially. So the Sultan uh, in the 1830s and 1840s sought both to take advantage of diplomatic relations and to impress specifically upon New Yorkers the quality of Western Indian Ocean goods. And before departing, uh, Ahmed bin Kwan uh, uh, commissioned a British captain to take a ship to, uh, to New York. Uh, and actually traveled to Bombay to recruit sailors there, uh, a crew of over 50. But one of the interesting parts of the story is the Sultana almost didn't make it to New York. This was, of course, a very long journey uh, that no one in the, uh, um, I mean, that none of his ships had made before. And what happened is that the ship stopped at St. Helena, this was Jamestown in the 18th is a very small island in the southwestern, sorry, in the, in the southern Atlantic Ocean. And the English captain who he had hired was a drunkard. <laughs> when he was in Jamestown, drank the whole time, became uh, essentially unconscious when they were set to leave. And so 
the thing that really had been saved this whole talk on its outward journey was the fact that while it had been in Jamestown, Nahman had, had overheard conversations amongst various captains about the best route to New York. <laughs> and he remembered these conversations. Uh, and so essentially, uh, while the captain was incapacitated for about a week, the Sultana sailed north towards New York without a captain, just on the memory of these conversations that, that, that Nahuan overheard. So it's, it's quite remarkable. And it made it safely to New York City. Um, after an 87 day journey. So after 87 days, the Sultan arrives in New York City. For the next few months, the ship would captivate the United States. New Yorkers, in fact, flocked to the wharf to get a glimpse of the ship and its crew. This is just a, a sort of a contemporary image of the flow of the hat, and you can see ships uh, docked just um, uh, in the background. In fact, newspaper reports, which are really fascinating for the time, because all the newspapers in New York covered uh, stories about the Sultan and the movement of the crew, the movement of the, um, the envoy. They recounted how the pier was actually so overcrowded that the sailors of the Sultan were, quote unquote, this is from a newspaper at the time, almost killed by the pushing and pressing and squeezing of the mobs, uh, end quote. People were so keen to see the ship and the crew. In fact, hundreds of visitors clamored to get on board. And you can see this is uh, an image of the wharf at the time. It already was a somewhat chaotic place and busy place. Now, Nahman very quickly sold the cargo, uh, almost immediately sold the cargo, and loaded about 90,000 yards of American cloth, so a pretty substantial amount. But this would only mark the beginning of the Sultanah's odyssey in the US. Firstly, to cement, so let me just talk about a couple elements of the next, the, the next few months. First, to cement diplomatic relations with the United States, uh, Nahuan presented President Martin Van Buren with gifts. These gifts were in themselves quite uh, interesting and telling. Two Arabian horses, very prized in the United States, um, a gold bar, uh, a string of pearls. I'll come back to this for a string of pearls. These actually aren't the horses themselves, but these were horses that were presented to uh, Queen Victoria, as you saw in the earlier. You can see horses coming off the Sultan. Uh, these were uh, two similar horses uh, that were given to uh, Queen Victoria uh, very soon thereafter. Uh, a string of pearls, we'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, two large uh, pearl shaped, uh, sorry, two large pear shaped pearls. Two silk carpets. Here's an image actually of one of those carpets. Another very fascinating story um, this Persian carpet was uh, still held. Smithsonian, but was put on display for a very long time, actually, in the 20th century, uh, in the, the um, uh, what's called the First Ladies' Hall. This is an image from 1955. You can see a very, very large uh, carpet. Six cashmere shawls, uh, rose essence, and a gold mounted sword. So quite a diverse array of gifts from the, the, the Sultanate's realm. I'll just show you this image. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is an image of the pearls, uh, and in fact, one of the very large pear-shaped pearls. Uh, of course, Oman was exporting pearls at the time, uh, and so this was a, you know, a very, uh, very, very expensive gift, but also from the, from the realm of the Sultanate. This is uh, Angelica Singleton Van Buren, who uh, Martin Van Buren did not have, uh, was not married, his wife had passed away, so his daughter-in-law essentially acted as the first lady. This is an image of her wearing the pearls um, from a portrait painted in 1842. Uh, this portrait is still in the White House, it's in the Red Room. This is a, an image of where it hangs now. So it actually is a very prominent position, although I think very few people know the history of the pearls that are so prominently featured in this image. The pearls, by the way, are 
But the White House explained that since the president was a public servant, he couldn't personally accept these gifts. Um, so the, the gifts were worn, in this case, by a known Van Buren, but the Van Burens could not personally accept these gifts, which actually created a conundrum that would define the subsequent history of these gifts, which is a history that's fascinating in its own right. And unfortunately, I don't have the, the, the time to uh, go into all the details, uh, but this is one of the Catherine de Shawls that was gifted in 1840. Now, now Juan explained he absolutely could not return to, um, uh, to the Sultan with the gifts. So a congressional debate ensued, which is in part why we have so much information about this. The Congress was actually debating what to do with all these gifts, including the horses. Could the president of the city? New Yorkers were so fascinated with uh, the mission and with offering Copy that soon after his arrival, as I mentioned, the New York City Common Council commissioned his portrait and didn't just commission a portrait at great expense, but displayed it in City Hall with the intention, with the intention that all could come in and view it um, for many, many years. And I want to say a, a word about this image because I think it in a surprising way, faithfully captured the elite fashion of 1840 Muscat and Zanzibar. Um, and what it did is it, it juxtaposed it with the image of the Sultana, albeit a very, very small image, but uh, one of the few images that we have, uh, framed it with this kind of neoclassical window and a you know, kind of neoclassical background. But I think this speaks to the way in which um, the Sultana uh, reflected a kind of, or, or the image reflected a kind of fascination, but also, uh, in many ways, it's a romantic image that is, in some ways, I mean, relatively positive, which isn't always the way in which uh, uh, Westerners represented Oman and Zanzibar, particularly um, in the latter 19th century. So this relatively positive light um, that, uh, in which New York City viewed the envoy, his vessel, and the mission, uh, as I think, uh, I mean, gives us a, a certain window into a US Omani Zanzibari relations at the time. Um, now, Nahman and his lieutenants had a very full schedule while they were in New York, because in many ways, like the Sultan of Zanzibar and Oman wanted to impress uh, Americans. New Yorkers wanted to impress the envoy and, um, and ultimately the Sultan of Oman Zanzibar. Uh, he was taken to ride on actually multiple railroads, railroads being sort of the high technology of the West at this point in time. Um, he was taken to visit a public hospital, which again was sort of a, um, a, a highlight of New York at the time. He was treated to a formal dinner at City Hall taken on a tour of the Brooklyn Navy Yard, um, tours of many, many other um, facilities, many other places in the New York City area. Mayors, city leaders, uh, naval commodores, and ultimately even the vice president paid visits to the Sultana. So not only was it receiving a lot of attention from the press, but it was receiving you know, significant uh, attention from political leaders. But just before the Sultana was meant to leave, days before it was supposed to leave, a terrible storm hit New York City. And in fact, lightning hit the Sultana directly. And the damages were immense, shattering one of its masts, um, basically debilitating the vessel. The interesting thing is the state response was overwhelming, immediate, and quite positive. The Navy received orders from Washington, D.C. to refit the Sultana, all at the U.S. government's expense, including giving it a new mast. And in fact, Nahman and the crew, the, his lieutenants as well as the whole crew, became guests of the U.S. Navy in Brooklyn. Um, in fact, an Ohio congressman announced that he intended to introduce a bill to Congress they would authorize the government not just to fix the Sultana, but to present the Sultan of Oman and Zanzibar with 
with an entirely new ship. So there was a, a very strong sense of goodwill and also the idea that this represented a new opportunity for New York-based merchants to engage with the West Indian Ocean. So again, this is a, both a diplomatic and commercial interest set sort of coming together. Ultimately, uh, Nakamon hired a new captain, an American captain from Philadelphia, uh, for the return journey and departed with uh, a refitted ship. Uh, they stopped in Cape Town. This is an image from about that time. Uh, Cape Town, South Africa, uh, en route to Zanzibar, uh, and then arrived back in Zanzibar later in 1840. Now, the denouement to the story is that the Sultano wouldn't return to the US. Um, but I think the important point here is that what happened with the New York City mission, this economic and diplomatic mission, is that it dramatically accelerated Oman Zanzibar's <coughs> outward projection. So in many ways, while uh, the Sultan didn't send another vessel to New York City, it was just the beginning of a dramatic expansion of Oman and Zanzibar's global projection. And that's what I want to I want to end with today. That in 1842, the Sultana again sailed to Britain. Um, uh, I should say the Sultana sailed to Britain very soon after uh, sailing to the United States with horses and salt and other gifts from Queen Victoria. Later missions to London, to Marseille, uh, to elsewhere in Europe, cultivated deeper relationships with the Atlantic and. Mediterranean. In fact, Nahman himself continued to represent the Sultan, including as a, a long-term representative to Réunion, a, a French-controlled island in the southwestern Indian Ocean. And after his return from New York, Nahman became a staunch supporter of uh, favorable, favorable relations with the U.S. In fact, he became a key member of what came to be known uh, in the Sultanate as the quote-unquote American faction. Um, these were advisors to the Sultan who lobbied hard for closer relations with, that, with, um, with the United States as a kind of buttress against the increasing British power in the Persian Gulf and, and the Indian Ocean more generally. This is a really interesting, important era in Omani's and history. Because they saw Nahman and others in this American faction of, of sort of merchants and a diplomatic elite of Oman and Zanzibar, they saw in the United States an alternative in terms of global relations to that with, with Britain, which was attempting to um, increase its control in the region, uh, its influence, I should say, in the region. And in fact, Nahman held this position uh, until, as far as I know, until his death. In 1870, so he was a, he was always uh, from that point in time on, from 1840s on, a strong proponent of close relations with the United States specifically. Now, after Said Said's death in 1856, his successors continued to dispatch ships, and this is why the Sultana story is really just a beginning to a much longer uh, story of uh, Omani's and Zanzibar's relations with the wider world, the wider both the Indian Ocean world and uh, Atlantic world and, and even beyond. By the way, um, this is an image from Zanzibar of Abu bin Nahman's grave uh, in Zanzibar town. Uh, as I mentioned, the Said Said's successors uh, continued to dispatch ships uh, to London, to Marseille, as I mentioned, but also to Bombay and throughout the Indian Ocean. They also ventured to other ports um, here's an image of uh, Zanzibar slightly later in the 1860s as the city grew uh, actually exponentially at, at, at mid century. Um, a Sultan of Zanzibar, uh, after Said Said, his son Majid, uh, sent vessels to uh, Istanbul, to Hamburg, and we actually know quite a bit about uh, one of these vessels, El Majidi which uh, Majid sent to Hamburg uh, uh, around 1870. 
because uh, my Jean's sister, Salma Binti Saeed, who uh, married a German merchant and uh, lived in Hamburg for, for quite some time, um, wrote about, uh, uh, about, about sailors from the Mycenae knocking on her door <laughs> uh, and uh, giving her news about Zanzibar, uh, you know, about current events in Zanzibar and Muscat. So uh, the, the Mycenae's visit to to Hamburg occasioned um, some interest as well. And in fact, as far as I know, these are the earliest mm -hmm. images that we have of, uh, of sailors on uh, either Omani or Zanzibari ships. Uh, this is an image from 1870, 1871 from, uh, from Hamburg. One of the sailors, uh, Abdullah, was the only name given. Another sailor um, uh, whose, whose name was given as Brian, who was a crew member of uh, the Mycenae uh, on its visit to Hamburg in 1870. So uh, these missions became much more, these trading ventures became much more regular, in fact. Um, Sultan Bargash Bin Said of Zanzibar in 1875 took this one step further, in fact. He himself visited uh, the UK and France in 1875. And in fact, Barbash's visit to, uh, to London and to Paris occasioned even more interest than the Sultanas uh, several decades earlier. Um, there's a lot of information on this. is from one of the illustrated uh, London magazines. It's depicting Barbash visiting all these different places, visiting railroads, visiting, um, stepping off an elevator. This is what the image in the center this actually uh, uh, was meant to strengthen, again, ties between, in this case, Zanzibar and, uh, and the UK. Uh, and Bargash, much like his father, attempted to capitalize on the attention that the visit received to basically raise the profile of um, his sultan and to promote trade. And that was his primary interest, or one of his primary interests, to, to promote trade with East Africa. In, uh, he also dramatically expanded his father's commercial vision by purchasing German and Scottish steamships and establishing a direct steamship service between Zanzibar and Bombay, uh, Bombay being kind of the, the rising industrial heart of the Western Indian Ocean in the 1870s. Um, this was actually quite important because it regularized transoceanic traffic and sort of well, not for the very first time, but, um, um, but in the 1870s, this is still very early on, free Indian Ocean travel from the rhythms of the monsoon. Steamships could travel all year round as frequently um, as possible, uh, bringing significant revenues to, to his, um, to Zanzibar's coffers. So let me just conclude by saying a couple words uh, about the legacy. Um, well, one legacy is, of course, uh, that it's remembered. These are postage stamps uh, from uh, Sultan of Oman, uh, one from 1986, uh, the other from 1990, uh, depicting um, Said Said, Ahmad as well as the vessel, uh, as well as the ship itself. But perhaps more than any single vessel, the Sultana, in its journey to the United States, evidence Oman Zanzibar's initiative in charting its own economic course in an era of increasing interdependence, but also an era of increasing European imperial expansion. In fact, the Sultana, the Sultana explored the possibility of multi-directional trade between the Indian Ocean and the Atlantic, something that no one had done before wherein, in this case, Omani Zanzibari vessels delivered American, uh, sorry, uh, delivered African, Arabian, and Asian products to foreign shores, to very distant shores, in this case, the US. And in this way, the Sultana was part of a, a wider and highly ambitious strategy of global projection and economic engagement. 
Now, these efforts didn't uh, fundamentally change the increasingly uneven or unequal global economic relationships that were emerging in the mid-19th century. But the Sultana's voyage was one of the earliest attempts by the Sultanate of Oman and Zanzibar to expand its relationships with states well beyond the Indian Ocean region, while also bolstering economic ties with the states. And in this way, the Sultana's journey to New York and many other journeys, uh, like al Majidi and others, uh, uh, both within and beyond the Indian Ocean world, evidenced global economic networks shaped not just by the actions and the interests of powerful empire, powerful European states, um, and other states like the United States, but also by the interests and enterprise of the other, of, of other and in some cases, less powerful states and actors like the Sultanate of Oman and Zanzibar. So I'll stop there.